Thanks, uh, Yvette, for uh, inviting me. Um, it's my se the second time I give a talk over Zoom, so uh, please uh, uh, have mercy on me. And yes, yeah, so I will talk about a joint work with uh, Mark Braverman, Gilad Kohl, and Raghuvan Saxena, all from Princeton University. And it's uh, about communication complexity. Um, there will be three, four parts to this talk. The first three parts are about the, the results, the, the paper, and the last part is a bonus part. And um, yeah, and they hope we'll get there because I think it's a very, it's some technical uh, notion that arises in our work, which also has connections to statistics and the probability theory, and I think it's very uh, interesting. Okay, so let's, uh, so let's begin. So we studied the following uh, communication complexity problem, which we call convex set disjointness. So we assume that uh, there is a fixed uh, domain called U, which is just a finite, finite subset of RD, of the Euclidean uh, D-dimensional space. And the inputs of each of the players are subset of U. So Alex gets an input X, Bob input is called Y. And their goal is to decide whether the convex halves of their inputs intersect or not. Equivalently, whether there is a hyperplane separating Alice's points from Bob's points. The communication model we assume is the standard one by, uh, by Yao. Uh, and the goal is to minimize the total number of bit sends. So in each round, each of the players sends a bit to the other player and the bits depend on the, on, the, on the history and on the inputs. Um, although we mostly focus here on the communication complexity, namely the number of bits, we also, of course, care about, uh, about the computational complexity, uh, that, uh, namely how the time complexity of the algorithm of each of the players. Um, okay, so let's have a, a quick warm up. So, uh, what is convex set disjointness in one dimension in R? So, here U is just a set of points on the line, n points on the line. We can, without loss of generality, we can think that these points are the numbers one up to n. Each of Alice's and Bob get a, get a subject of, of these points, and they need to decide whether the interval containing Alice's points intersects the interval containing Bob's points. Now, it's easy to see that this happens if and only if the rightmost point of Alice is to the left from the leftmost point of Bob, or vice versa. So, in this one dimensional case, uh, deciding the convex set disjointness problem amounts to solving two great, two comparisons. So comparisons between two numbers. And in fact, it is, equi so it is equivalent to the greater than problem on log n bits. Why log n bits? Because we have n points. Each point can be represented using log n bits. And this problem, the greater than problem in which we need to compare two numbers um, has been uh, studied. And it is known that you can solve it deterministically using log n bits of communication. And uh, if you allow randomness and the small uh, probability of error, then you can do it with log log n, so exponentially greater. Okay, so this is the one dimensional case. Sure. Is there Sorry. a question? Yeah. How yeah. is the input represented? I don't understand. I would have thought it would have been like you describe it as a list of half planes or something. So we assume that the domain U, right? We let's go back to the first slide. We assume that the domain U is a fixed known subset of RD. So the protocol depends on U. And since it has size n, you can represent each point in U using log n bits or, 
Or you can also represent, you know, a subset of U using an n-bit vector, just the indicator uh, function of the subset. Got it. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, um, so we concluded that in one dimension, in dimension one, the convex at the joinness problem boils down to greater than, which is a well-studied problem in uh, communication complexity. What happens in dimension n? Well, in dimension n, I can pick, I can pick the domain u of n, ve n, n vectors to be linearly independent or affinely independent. And what does this mean? That the convex halves of a pair of subsets intersect if and only if the sets themselves intersect, right? That's the... Ah, is n of the points and n of the dimension the same n? Now, yes, yes, yes. Now it's the same n. Yeah, I, I say that if the n points are in dimension n, then you can pick the domain u to contain n linearly independent vectors such that the, this property holds. The convex halves intersect if and only if the, the sets themselves intersect. So if we do that, if we pick such a domain U, we, the, the geometry does not give us any further information. We just get a combinatorial problem, namely they get a pair of subsets and they need to decide whether these sets intersect or not. So this is called the set disjointness problem in communication complexity. And uh, it, it is one of the most famous problems in this uh, area. And it's known that uh, both, so we, you cannot, one cannot solve it faster than basically transmitting all the inputs uh, um, to one of the players and let them solve it alone. Okay, so. So basically what we have is that in the, in the intermediate dimension between one and n, we have some kind of a geometric interpolation between greater than and set disjointness. So we know that in dimension one, this problem is easy. It takes log n or log log n bits to solve. In dimension n, this problem may be very hard. Namely, one cannot do anything non-trivial then and the question is what happens for intermediate dimensions in between one and then. Okay, so um, this is one uh, motivation for studying this problem. Another motivation uh, is related to distributed optimization. So in distributed optimization, maybe, maybe the most basic problem, problem is uh, linear programming. And the decision version of this problem, we are given um, a list of uh, m half spaces, m constraints. And we wish to, to find or to decide whether there exists uh, an, a solution satisfying all of them. Whether there exists an x that satisfies all the m inequalities. Now, in distributed LP feasibility, uh, the constraints will be distributed between different parties. Okay, so we focus here on the two-party problem. So the constraints will, some of the constraints will uh, will be given to Alice and some to Bob. And if you think about it a little bit, then you see that convex set disjointness is equivalent up to factor one additive in the dimension to distributed LP because, but in a dual formulation, because the existence of a point satisfying all constraints amounts to the existence of a hydroplane um, separating the, the, the dual points in the dual space. So it's, so, so basically uh, distributed LP and convex disjointness are essentially the same problem, but from a dual perspective. Um, and the last motivation I want to discuss for studying this problem is distributed learning. So, um, so in distributed learning, the goal is to approximate an unknown target concept from examples 
and we assume that the examples are distributed between the parties. And um, yeah, so um, instances of it in real life are, for example, recommendation uh, systems where the examples, the user preferences are distributed on our smartphones and there is a, a machine learning algorithm on the cloud that uh, uses them. And so one solution is of course that each, each user will send all of their data to the centralized machine. But of course this is costly from a communication perspective and also maybe this is a, this is not so good from a privacy perspective. You want to keep your most of the most of your data to yourself. You don't want to share it with the central. So uh, yeah, so we so it is it would be beneficial if you can train the machine learning algorithm in a distributed fashion without sending all of the examples to the centralized machine. Okay, so how what does this have to do with uh, with the convex Jones problem. So let's think about the problem of distributed learning of half spaces. So what, let me define this problem. So again, we assume a fixed known domain of size N in RD. And now the player's inputs are uh, examples, sequences of examples, where each example is a pair a point from you and a label which is either negative or positive. And we further assume that the positive labeled examples and the negative labeled examples are separated by a hyperplane. So the convex hull of the red points and the convex hull of the uh, blue points are uh, disjoint. And uh, our goal, the goal in learning is to that Alice and Bob will, again, uh, communicate as little as possible, but at the end of the day, they need to agree on a classifier, namely a function from the domain to plus minus, which interpolates, which agrees with the input examples. So this classifier, this function H, has to be positive on the positive examples and negative on the negative examples. So one, one option, for instance, is to output a hyperplane. So we assume there exists a hyperplane separating the positive and negative. You, we can just, they can just agree on such a half space. But they can also agree on more complicated functions. The only requirement really is that whatever function they agree on should be positive on the positive examples and negative on the negative examples. Um, Okay, so let me now state uh, the main results and, uh, and later we discuss some of the, some aspect of the proof. So, so let's uh, still focus on this distributed learning of half spaces problem. So uh, previous works, so in dimension one, this is the, uh, as we said before, this is like the greater than problem. So it's log n or log log n. So the interesting case is they mentioned larger than one. So there is an upper bound of roughly d log square n by Dow et al and Balkan et al, which is based on a boosting uh, uh, approach. And there is a lower bound of uh, d plus log n uh, which is in a previous paper with uh, with Kane, Livni, and Yudayov. Um, yes. So this. So uh, as you can see, there is still a, there, there is still a, uh, there was a little gap. And what we prove for for an upper bound, we showed it for every domain U of size n. There is a learning protocol for half spaces with communication complexity d log d log n. So, um, and let me, so this is a deterministic protocol. Let me tell you some, something about this protocol. It's deterministic. It can also be efficiently implemented 
but assuming, but then we need public randomness. So if we want an efficient implementation, uh, we need public randomness. One interesting and maybe a disadvantage of this protocol is that it's improper. Namely, the so remember that in the learn problem, they need to agree on a function which separates the negative from the positive examples. It is natural to require this function to be a half space because this is what we're trying to learn. But uh, one feature of this protocol is that this function is not a half space. It will be something else, a little bit more complicated. And I think it's an interesting open problem to to find out whether you whether one can solve you know, with the same communication complexity with a proper product protocol. Um, okay, and we also achieve a newly matching lower bound. What does this mean? So for every d, which is at least two, uh, there exists a set. Uh, there is the domain of site N in RD such that any protocol for half traces for learning half traces on this domain requires at least D log N bits. Okay. Um, and, and the lower bound applies also for randomized protocols. So, so the upper bound is achieved by a deterministic protocol and the lower bound applies also for randomized protocols. And of course, it also applies for improper protocols. So it does not assume that the output function is a half space. Um, yeah, and I will talk a little bit later about uh, the proof. So let's keep these two comments for now. So, for convex set disjointness and LP feasibility, these are so this 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 is the second problem we did, we discussed. Uh, so these are two equivalent problems: the set convex set disjointness and LP feasibility. As we said, it's a dual; uh, uh, they are dually related. So the previous works are um, d cube log square n by Kane and Vempala. And the, 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 there is also a better protocol of d squared log n up to log d factors, but this assumes that the domain u is agreed. So this is based on um, on implementing uh, um, uh, cutting planes uh, like optimization algorithms, like uh, like the ellipsoid. Um, and as for lower bounds, uh, d plus log n, there is a log n lower bound which applies even when u is agreed. So it's the same, it's this stepping that was considered by Vempale et al. And there also has been a d log n lower bound for the terministic protocols. And our result is that we give an upper bound uh, of d squared log d log n. Um, again, it's a deterministic protocol. It's a, it can be efficiently implemented efficiently given public randomness, and it applies for arbitrary domains. And we give a lower bound of D log n. Um, and notice that there is an interesting, uh, there's, there is still a gap here, a quadratic gap at, on the dependence on D. So we know that the lower bound is D log N and the upper bound is D squared log N up to a log D factor. And I think it would be interesting to understand how much communication one needs for linear programming uh, to, to, to find out the right dependency or for convexity jointness. It's a basic problem. Okay. Um, now let me tell you a little bit now about um, the geometric tools uh, we, we, we used in deriving this uh, lower and upper bounds. Um, okay, so I think the, the main uh, 
technical contribution is of hub space containers. So let me define uh, this notion of what is a container. So assume we are given a, a domain U on RD as before, and then we have two subsets of RD. So they are not necessarily subsets of the domain. So H and C are subsets of RD. So we say that C in the container, epsilon contains H, if first of all H is a subset of C, and the number of points from the domain that are in C and not in H is small, is at most an epsilon fraction of the domain. Okay? So it means that, again, so C epsilon contains H if C contains H, and also the difference between them is small when restricted to the domain. And it is natural, and, and we'll do it later, to extend this definition to arbitrary distribution on RD. So instead of, uh, so you can imagine a distribution, a given distribution U on RD, and U can be the, the uniform distribution over the domain U, but it can be also something else. And then we will say that H, that C epsilon contains H, if again, it contains H, and the measure of the difference between them is at most epsilon. So, okay, so um, what is the result? So we show that uh, for every domain U, or for in fact, for any distribution on RD, you can find a small family of sets calligraphic C, uh, in particular finite, so it's size d over epsilon to the O of d, such that for every half space in Rd, there exists a container in this family of containers which epsilon contains it. Okay, so I repeat, so for any domain U or for any distribution on Rd, there exists a small, a finite small family of subsets which covers, which epsilon covers all half spaces on RD. Yeah, the crucial point, the upper bound does not depend on N, it only depends on, uh, on epsilon and on D. And as I said, it extends to arbitrary distribution. And this is, notice that a related notion is the notion of epsilon cover. So you can define, given a distribution mu, on RD, you can define a metric between two sets. If the measure of the symmetric difference is the distance between them. So a uh, container family is in particular an epsilon cover in this metric, but, but not only the, but this requirement that the, that, that C must contain H is, uh, is, is significant. Is, uh, and of course, it, um, it's interesting to, to find the tight bounds. So, um, yeah, so the upper bound we give is D over epsilon to the O of D, and the lower bound is, uh, is one over epsilon to the D. And um, it will be interesting to find uh, the right dependence. And I will talk more about this notion from a statistical perspective at the fourth part of the talk. Okay, so this is for half spaces containers. And um, another two uh, kind of small lemmas that we had to use, but I think they are interesting in their own right, are variants of Karateodori theorem. So let me remind you what Karateodori theorem is. So Karateodori theorem says that um, that uh, <clears throat> given a point which is inside a convex set, so we have a point X and the set Y and X is inside the convex hull of, uh, of Y, then we can find Y prime of size at most D plus one, such that X already lies in the convex hull of Y prime. Right, so in the plane, if we have a point, a red point inside a convex polygon, so this point is already inside a triangle 
determined by the vertices of this polygon. And in higher dimensions, it's a, a simply says instead of triangles. Okay, so uh, one uh, variant we proved is a symmetric variant. So, um, so what is the symmetric variant? So now we are given two convex sets, so it's not a point and a convex set, or two, con two, two sets, X and Y, that have, uh, that such that their convex cells intersect. Then you can find two subsets, Y prime of Y and X prime of X, such that already they witness that the convex cells intersect, or the convex cells of the two subsets intersect. And moreover, the sum of sizes of X prime and Y prime is at most D plus two, right? So it is something like this. If we have, here we have two convex polygons that intersect, and we can see that there are, that there are two edges of these polygons that already intersect. So altogether four vertices. And notice that uh, this implies the original curvature by setting the set X to be the singleton X. So if we have X, small X inside the convex L of Y, we can just set X to be the singleton X and apply the symmetric variant and deduce the original variant. And the proof is very simple. It's in fact uh, really the same proof like the, the original variant. It's uh, some kind of induction using linear algebra. So it's a, uh, yeah, but it's. Uh, so this is one variant of Karate Odori. Another variant is, um, is requires the following point of view. So um, there are two natural ways of representing a polytope in RD. One is as a convex hull of vertices. And the other is intersection of half spaces, right? So if you have a convex, any convex set is an intersection of half spaces. And if we have a polytope, so we can define it in two, in two ways. And if you think about it, what Karateodori theorem says is that if P has N vertices, then it can be covered by N to the D plus one subsymplices, so N to the D plus one subsymplices at most. Right, because every point in the polytope belongs to a simplex determined by d plus one vertices. Uh, so you can also ask whether a, a dual phenomena holds. So, and this is what we showed: that if P is a polytope that is now an intersection of m half spaces, then it can be covered by m to the d sub simplices. And um, this is not entirely trivial because, you know, some polytopes like the L infinity cube, they can be represented by few half spaces. So the L infinity cube in RD is determined by 2D half spaces, but it has 2 to the D vertices. So this tells you that if that even for polytopes, just that the dual representation is compact, you can cover them by a few simplices. And uh, also our proof is, is gives uh, an, an algorithm essentially for finding the simplex in, in Discover. And let me note that this result can also be proven using the upper bound theorem from, from convex geometry but uh, this will not give uh, an efficient uh, algorithm. Okay. So are there, are there any questions before I, uh, before I uh, start discussing the proofs? Yeah, so uh, do your bounds really depend just on the VC dimension or is it specific to RD? No, so everything is about RD, right? So we didn't, uh, so, um, yeah, we just, uh, you, you mean the results in communication complexity? And whether there's some sort of generalization where this D parameter is just some VC dimension or some dimension of something. Again, again, Yuval? 
whether there's an extension and generalization of these results where this D is some other parameter rather than just the dimension of RD. So, but you refer to the results in communication complexity because I'm not even sure what the geometric results mean in this abstract context. So, um, no, so our results are very geometric, so they do not extend to, to arbitrary classes. The results in, in the, for example, so the learning uh, result uh, applies to the, for RD, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Another question, um, sorry, about the containers that you stated. Uh, do you know anything if the containers themselves are required to be half spaces? Yes, it, so that's a very good question. Um, we will talk about it soon, I think. Um, so, no, the containers cannot be half spaces. If you require the containers to be half spaces, then you, then you cannot, uh, so you must use infinitely many containers. You cannot do it with just finitely many. Um, and, yeah, so, so and it's, it's, it's important that, con that containers will not be half spaces. But in fact, the, the containers that we get are not so complicated. Uh, they are essentially the complements of intersections of D half spaces. Okay, so it's a complement of a convex set, which is uh, pretty simple. It's an intersection of D half spaces. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's see some uh, get an idea of what's how the proof uh, look like. So again, let's focus on this uh, distributed learning of half spaces problem. So let me remind you what it is. So we, again, we assume a fixed domain of size n known to both players. Alice, each of the players gets a sequence of examples. Each example is a point from the domain and the sign minus or plus. We assume that the positive and negative examples are separated. This is a promise, they are separated by a hive plane. And the goal is to that both Alice and Bob will agree on the same function, which is positive on the positive examples and negative on the negative examples. Okay, so this is the problem. So yes, so the upper bound is that we can do it in in uh, actually the, it's d log d log n. I don't know why there is an extra. It's a, it's a typo. So it's not d square log d log n. It's d log d log n. So we will first assume that um, that Alice gets all the positive examples and Bob, get, Bob gets all the negative examples. Later we will see how to remove this assumption, but it would be uh, convenient to first assume that all positive examples possessed by Alice and all negative examples possessed by Bob. So the protocol I will describe to you will have log n rounds. In each round, one of the players will send uh, d log d bits. So the total number of uh, bits will be d log d log n. And, uh, and the idea is to construct this output function round by round. Okay, so we will start with the output function being empty, so it is undefined. And on round k, it will be defined on a uh, one minus three quarters to the k fraction of the domain. So in particular, after roughly log n rounds, it will be, be defined on the entire domain. Uh, so that's, that's the idea. Now let, let's see how we do it. So, so that's, that's how the inputs uh, looks like. So the black points are points in U that are not part of the inputs. The blue points are uh, Bob's points, and the red points are Alice's points. And um, so the first thing they do is they agree on a family of containers with epsilon equals one quarter. And by, I remind you that we assume that there exists such a family of size d to the O of d, d to the 2d. That's, uh, that's uh, one of our results. Okay, so what, what do they do next? So imagine, uh, so we know that there exists a hyperplane H which separates the positive 
from the negative examples, the blue from the red points. So this hyperlink is not known to Alice and Bob, but it exists. Now, one of its sides, either the blue side or, or, the, or the red side, contains at most half of the points in U, half of the total points in U, right? Because this hyperplane partition U to two parts, one of the parts, one of the parts is the size of most N over two. Okay, so let's assume that uh, this is Bob's parts. So the blue, the, the blue part. So Bob can find the container in, in the family C, which contains all of its negative example and at most three quarters of all points, right? So there exists a, the, the half space contains at most half the points and all blue examples. So the container for that half space will still contain all the blue examples and maybe some more points, but no more than epsilon times n, which is one quarter time n. So altogether, the, the, this uh, container in C will contain at most three quarters of all points and all of the examples possessed by Bob. So Bob can just simply send Alice, the, tell Alice the name of this container. So we call that there are d to the order of d many containers. So we can send d log d bits specifying the name of this container. And then they can just label all points outside the container is positive, remove them, and proceed to the next round. Okay, so notice that uh, in each round, the, we label an additional one quarter of remaining points and, uh, and, and, and proceed as, as we planned. Shai? I have yes. a quick question. So in the previous case, Bob has to go through all the containers in the family. So all D to the order D containers to find this guy. So no. So as I so okay, we will get to it later. So actually, there is an efficient algorithm to do it. So Bob will just use. He will not need to go through this okay. exponentially in the many containers. He has a polynomial time algorithm for finding one. But uh, but for now, let's focus on the communication complexity. And there we don't care if it goes through all of them. Mm -hmm. It okay. only matters how many bits uh, uh, Bob needs to specify the name of uh, an appropriate container. OK, thanks. OK. OK, so now we assume that the positive and negative examples are uh, separate, uh, like Alice has all, all positive and Bob has all negative. What happens if they are mixed? OK, so what happens? So, so this is the picture. So Alice's inputs are labeled A, Bob's inputs are labeled B. Alice has both blue and red inputs and also Bob. And their goal is to, is to, to, to agree on a function that classifies all blue points blue and red points red. What they do, so this is a, a little bit confusing, but it's very simple. So they apply the previous protocol on Alice's positive versus Bob negatives and on Alice negatives versus Bob positives. Okay, so they get, a, they get two classifiers, two functions that uh, accordingly and and this function they partition the domain u to four parts right so we have a plus plus minus minus plus minus and minus plus according to the labels of each of these two functions and now observe that plus plus contains only positives so we can safely label all points in this region as positive minus minus contains only negative points. So we can safely label all of the points in this region as negatives. Now the observation is that plus minus contains only inputs of Alice and minus plus contains only inputs of Bob. So what they can do is they can pick a half space 
each of them le privately learns a half space which separates uh, the corresponding region and send the name of this half space to the other player. So the, the final classifier will look something like this. It's a partition of the, of the, of the space to, uh, to, what is it, six regions. And each region is labeled uh, according to how it should be. Okay, and the additional uh, cost is just D log n bits twice to, to, to send the name of a separator in the minus plus and plus minus regions. Okay. So, um, so let, let's, let's summarize it. So we have just shown that for every domain U, there is a learning protocol with uh, communication complexity d log d log n and uh, the crux really the crux of the of the protocol is this the existence of, of containers of few containers and uh, okay yeah so so let me now say a few comments about the construction of containers um, so the proof is constructive. So given an input H, we efficiently find uh, a container that epsilon contains it. And really the counting argument goes through the algorithm. So the description of the containers, if you look at the transcript of the algorithm that finds C given the input H, the description of C only uses D log D over epsilon bits. And hence the, the theorem follows because the number of containers is at most the number of uh, bit strings of this length. Um, yeah, so the construction has two parts. So there is a pre-processing part, which is randomized. They basically find a good epsilon net. And this is why they will need public randomness in order to efficiently, in order for, for, to efficiently implement this protocol. And then the derivation, once we do this preprocessing, which is polynomial in NND, uh, the derivation is completely deterministic. It consists of solving linear programming. Um, yeah, and the second part also uses this dual characteristic that we can cover every uh, polytop with M faces using M, M to the D uh, simply says. Um, let me mention that uh, there is an alternative proof for the existence of containers, which uh, uses the notion of cuttings from computational geometry. But um, the obtained algorithm or the preprocessing of the obtained algorithm is exponential in D, whereas what we do is polynomial in D and then and log n. Okay, so. Yeah, so let's uh, proceed to the lower bound unless there are some, if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer. But otherwise, let's proceed to the lower bound. So, uh, wait, are you going to show us the construction of containers? I will, um, I will not show the construction of containers, but I will go get back to talking a lot about containers at the last part because it, uh, I, I will, yeah, I will show. I will describe connections to statistics and to, but so uh, maybe you can say a few words about, if you are not going to show us this, maybe you can say a few words about how you construct the container. Um, I can try. So it's up to you. I just, <laughs> I just, yeah, I'm trying to think if, you know, given the, Circumstances, how easy it is. Um, no, no, I think I will. Uh, I will. Uh, maybe I'll try in the end if you still have energy. Okay. Is it is it really simple in two dimensions or much simpler in two dimensions? No, 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 it's a, uh, so, 
So it's basically, so as I said, there are two parts. The first part is, um, is this finding a good epsilon net, but already this epsilon net is an epsilon net not for half spaces, but it's for a more complicated uh, family that only saying it now is, uh, is a bit, uh, we confused, will probably be confusing. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is really, is, is in a dual space. So nothing is really complicated, but but it's uh, but it's a bit uh, but there are many details. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so uh, uh, the structure of containers is that uh, uh, each is a complement of the intersection of, in this case, two half spaces in the plane. So it's, uh, it's just yes. a bit, uh, you have this and you take all but one region. Exactly, exactly, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, let's proceed to the lower bound. Lower bound is, is, um, is, is simpler. Um, so again, I'll remind you the statement. So for every V, which is at least two, we can find uh, endpoints in RD such that any protocol for um, for convex heavy jointness on new requires d log n bits. Um, so the idea is to use a kind of a direct sum argument. We first prove a log n lower bound for d equals two. And then we kind of take d copies of this uh, hard instance, hard planar instance, and obtain uh, d log n lower bound in, R, in Rd, or R3d it will be. Um, so first let's, let's consider the, the planar case. So the idea is to pick the points in U, pick the domain U to be points in convex position. So for instance, on a, on, on a, on a circle, so the crucial, the crucial property is that every point can be separated from the rest by a half lane, as, as illustrated by this uh, uh, image. And now the, the inputs are also really lopsided. So Alice gets a single positive point, and Bob gets a set of negative points, okay? Now notice that the uh, inputs are separable if and only if Alice's point is not in Bob's set, right? Because, because of the convex position property. And, and this is also easier than learning half planes, right? If we can learn half planes, in particular, we can, we can tell whether Alice's point is not in Bob's set, right? Because Alice's point is positive and Bob's point is negative, right? If we can find a function that is positive on, the, on Alice's point and negative on Bob's point, then it cannot be that Alice's point is in Bob's set. So we can solve this decision problem by applying any learning protocol and, and just see if it failed or not, if it succeeded in finding a function. Right, a function in the learn protocol is a witness that the set are disjoint, that Alice's point is not in Bob's set. Um, now, yeah, so this is basically a membership problem, right? Alice gets a single point, Bob gets a set of points, and they need to, to decide whether Alice's point is in Bob's set, and it is not, um, it is not hard to see that this is equivalent to set disjointness on log n bits. Okay, it's a, I will not get into the details, it's a simple reduction. Um, but the bottom line is that solving this membership problem requires log n bits, even if you allow uh, randomized protocols. Um, okay, now how do we lift it to, to D dimensions? So, we take D copies of this planar construction, right? So we take basically D circles, uh, and on each of them we place N over D points, such that the total number of points will be N. 
uh, and we place them orthogonally in R3D. Okay? So the reason we have 3D and not 2D is because we want that the separators will be homo homogeneous, will pass through the origin. So um, that's why we have 3D. And if we do it like that, if really the separators pass through the origin, so precisely one of the following holds. So given uh, given the inputs for Alice and Bob, so either Alice's i input is in Bob i set, or if this does not happen, then Alice's input are linearly separated from the union uh, of Bob sets. And the reason is because uh, we place them orthogonally, and then if we have a separator in each of the orthogonal subspaces, then the sum of the separators will separate uh, everything. Um, yeah, so this is uh, really a simple uh, construction. And, and, and what you get is essentially a set disjointness on d log n over d bits, and hence the lower bound follows. Um, OK. Okay, let me proceed now to a few open questions for future research about the communication problem. And then uh, the last part, I will, uh, I will tell you a little bit more about uh, containers and brackets and the, uh, uh, okay. So let me summarize what we've seen. So we discussed the three related communication complexity problems convex at jointness, distributed LP feasibility, and the uh, learning of half traces. And the main result is that we gave uh, improved bounds for one and two, and uh, we gave a newly tight bound up to log D factor for uh, uh, the learning problem. And let's see some open problems. So again, I think one natural open problem is to in the learning setting for the learn problem to, to give an, a proper protocol. So, so our our the, the final function we Alice and Bob agreed on was very was not half space. It was something much more complicated, and it is it would be interesting to find the half space, especially since we are learning half spaces. You know, maybe. Um, yeah, so, um, and let me know that in this context, there is a, so when the, when U is agreed, when the domain is, uh, is agreed, which is the case in all applications, there is a proper protocol with D squared log N by Vempala et al. And uh, for arbitrary domains, in a previous work, we gave uh, d cube log square n protocols, which is based on uh, on boosting. Okay, so this is for proper learning. Uh, another um, natural uh, variant is agnostic learning. So, what what is this uh, problem? So here again, we have we assume a domain U of n points. Additionally, we have a, an excess AO parameter, epsilon, and the inputs are the same. But we no longer assume that the, that the red and the blue points are separated by a hydroplane. So now, um, you know, the, convex, the blue convex hull and the red convex hull may intersect. And the goal is to agree on a function whose misclassification AO the number of points it misclassifies is at most epsilon times n worse than the best half space, right? So every half space uh, will have some misclassification error, right? Because the inputs are not separable. There is some best half space. And the goal is to compete with it. Okay, so that's the problem. So, and again, epsilon is another input uh, in this problem. This is the excess. Um, so what are the known bounds? So um, using um, standard um, um, 
results in uh, statistical learning, you can get a protocol of d log n over epsilon squared. Okay. And this can further be improved if you use geometric discrepancy. So you can, so you, you still get the, uh, so yeah, dependence on D may be deteriorate, but the dependence on epsilon decreases from epsilon squared to epsilon to the two minus some function of D, essentially two minus one over D. And, but both of these uh, bounds are obtained by one round protocol. So basically, what happens there is that each of Alice and Bob computes a, a, a small corset for their inputs and they just publish the corset. It's a, uh, and then they just learn, find the best half space on the corset. So it's really, it's not really interactive. It's not, uh, we don't use here the power of interaction. It's basically taking, um, Standard well-known results in the in the static setting and and exploiting them to get one round protocols. As for lower bounds, um, we know that even in the planar case, at least one over epsilon bits are required. So still, as you can see, there is a, even if we just ask about the dependence on epsilon there is a pretty significant gap between epsilon squared to, to epsilon to the one. And, and yeah, I'm not sure what I would conjecture here, but, but for sure we did not, uh, these upper bounds, even those that improve on epsilon squared, do not use uh, interaction. So maybe, maybe it can be improved. Um, Yes, and of course, the last open problem is about the convex at the jointness or LP feasibility. So again, there is a quadratic gap in D. In particular, if D equals square root N, it is not clear whether one can do anything non-trivial, right? If D equals square root N, then D squared becomes N, which amounts to sending the entire input from Alice to Bob, and she can solve it privately. So, um, and also, of course, it would be interesting to consider these uh, problems for when there are more than two parties, not just Alice and Bob. In, uh, in practice, um, you have more than two parties, right? In the, if we think about these uh, recommendation systems that are trained on, on various smartphones, so there are, there are many, many parties there. Uh, yeah, so so all of these problems are um, essentially wide open. Um, okay, so we are done with talking about communication complexity. And now I want to tell you a little bit more about containers and brackets and statistics. But uh, maybe first, if there are any questions about the previous, um part also maybe if you want to take a break of a few minutes you don't have to sure yeah so um how much time actually do we have we have usually two hours so until 12 30. Um, okay so uh yeah maybe i'll go get myself one more cup of coffee and then we'll talk about brackets sounds good so, um so okay so may i have any yeah please go ahead okay good so yeah so the last part as i said in the beginning is um is pretty much uh, um self-contained um so yeah it's about containers brackets and laws of large numbers so let us first uh, remind ourselves what are laws of large numbers. So, um, so assume we have uh, you know some probability space, namely we have a domain X, we have some probability measure on X, and then we have some arbitrary event F. Now, given 
IID samples from mu, from the probability measure, we can estimate the measure of f by just taking the empirical measure, right? We just sum, we, take, we look at the fraction of points that were sampled and belong to f. Right, and how good is this empirical estimate? Well, we have churn of bound, which tells us that uh, given a uh, epsilon, which is an arrow parameter and delta, if we take more than n epsilon delta samples, then with high confidence, at least one minus delta, the arrow between the true measure and the observed measure is at most epsilon. Right, and, and here the, the, the the um, expression for n of epsilon delta, log one over delta over epsilon squared, is just uh, what, what is implied by churn of bound. Okay, so this is a, this is a quantitative version, if you want, of the law of large numbers. Uh, the more abstract uh, one says that uh, n epsilon delta exists, not only for uh, events, but not only for like f when f is an event, but also for unbounded measurable functions as long as you have as the first moment exists but but let us focus on the on the zero one case here yeah so this is a law of large numbers right so uh, if we have enough uh, samples the empirical estimate is close to the population to the to, to the true measure with high probability what are uniform laws of large numbers okay so now Instead of a single event whose measure we wish to estimate, we have a family of events. Okay, so we have many, many events. And let us say that this family F satisfies a uniform law of large numbers. If again, for every error parameter and confidence parameter, epsilon delta, there is some finite bound and epsilon delta such that if we observe at least n epsilon delta samples, then with high probability, at least one minus delta, it will hold that simultaneously for all events in the family, the empirical measure is a good approximate, is an epsilon approximate to the true measure, to the population measure. Namely, it's not that mu n so mu n now approximates mu simultaneously for all f all events f in in the family okay good so of course uh, every finite family of events satisfies this uniform law of large numbers and this follows by a union bound right so if we take if we again we use chernoff and we take log m, log size of the family, plus log one over delta over epsilon squared samples, then with probability at least one minus delta, all empirical estimates will be epsilon close to the true measures. And basically what we did here is that if we have uh, n1 of epsilon delta, is is what what we what what is promised for a fixed event f then we can replace delta by delta over m and apply union bound and then we get it for m events okay so the finite case is pretty straightforward what happens for infinite families how so like you can imagine many interesting infinite families, for example, all the dimensional half places, but you can also think of non-geometric context. And can, how, how does one prove a uniform law of large numbers for infinite families? So again, we wish to prove that given enough samples, the empirical measures estimate the true measures simultaneously for every event in the family. So of course we cannot repeat the, 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 the union bound from the previous slide because we cannot take a union bound over infinitely many events. Okay, so the idea, so we will see now that the containers or brackets um, give us such a very simple way of doing that. Okay, so let me define what a bracket is. 
So again, we assume this, we have this measure mu and we have an event F. Now a pair of events G1 and G2 are called an epsilon bracket for F if G1 is a subset of F and G2 is a superset of F. So F is sandwiched between G1 and G2. And on top of that, the measure of the difference between G2 and G1 is at most epsilon. Okay. Um, what is the bracket family? So a family G is an epsilon bracket family for a family F. If every F in F, every event in F, admits a bracket, admits a pair of uh, events in G, which forms an epsilon bracket for, the, for it. Okay? Now, what is the connection between bracket families and container families? Right? So what is the connection? So um, clearly, every bracket family is also a container family, right? Because G2, if, if we only take G2, so the difference between G2 and F has at most epsilon measure. Actually, it has strictly, strictly less than epsilon measure because G1 and G2 um, have epsilon difference. What about the opposite direction? Well, not always, but often it, it is the case. So assume that F is symmetric, namely F is closed under taking complements. Any event in F satisfies that also the complement of this event is in F. For example, half faces. Right, half space, complement of a closed half space is an open half space. So it is easy to see that if G is an epsilon container family for F, then G union the complements of all uh, events in G is a two epsilon bracket uh, for F. Right, if we, right, because a bracket of the complement or the, the complement of a bracket of, the, of a container of the complement is exactly this G1, right? Take F, look at the complement of F, take the container for it, and take the complement of that container. This will give you G1. So this is really a simple, uh, simple manipulation. Okay, good. So as a corollary, we get that for every distribution U on RD, by our previous result, there exists a family of epsilon brackets for half traces of a finite size, D over epsilon to the O of D. Okay, so what does this have to do with these uh, infinite union bounds? So I claim that if we have a finite family of epsilon containers, of epsilon brackets, we can get, uh, we can prove a uniform law of large numbers. Let's see this. So here is, uh, here is the, the statement. It's, I attributed it to Libenko and Cantelli because that's essentially how they proved that uh, the empirical CDF converges to the CDF. Um, so yeah, so let's, let's read the statement. So again, we assume we have a distribution mu and Assume that, to, that the, the family of interest of events, family F, has an epsilon over two brackets of size two to the B. I, I write two to the B because in channel bound we take log of size. Then, if F has such a small family of, contain, of uh, brackets, then F also satisfies a uniform law of large numbers for uh, an epsilon delta being B plus log one over delta divided by epsilon over two squared. And the proof is really, really simple. Let's, uh, let's try to do it uh, over Zoom. Um, so if we just apply Chernoff plus union bound on the family G, on the family of brackets, we get that uh, if we take these many examples, these many samples and epsilon delta, we get that every G in G the, the empirical measure is epsilon over two close to the, to, the, to the true measure, to the target measure. This is again, just a union bound over a finite family because G is finite and has size two to the B. Um, 
Therefore, and now we're going to use the fact that F is sandwiched, is bracketed by G. So for every event F in, in, in the family, we have two facts. So the first fact is that the, the empirical measure of F is also sandwiched between the, the, the empirical measure of G1 and the empirical measure of G2, because F is a subset of G2 and a superset of G1. And also notice that by, by chain of a union bound, this interval between the measure of G1 and measure of G2, the empirical measures, is contained in a slightly larger interval uh, defined by the target measures. Okay. So we know that the empirical measure of F belongs to the interval whose left point is the true measure of G1 minus epsilon over two, and whose right point is the true measure of G2 plus epsilon over two. On the other hand, um, just by, uh, by monotonicity, we know that the true measure of F is, between, is sandwiched between the true measure of G1 and the true measure of G2. Here, I just use the fact that F is a superset of G1 and the subset of G2. So we know that mu n of F and mu of F uh, uh, belong to these intervals. So mu of F belongs to the interval between mu of G1 and mu of G2, and mu n of F belongs to a slightly enlarged interval uh, by epsilon over 2. But since uh, mu of G1 and mu of G2 are apart, by epsilon over two, so the, 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 the length of the second interval in item two is at most epsilon over two, we immediately get that uh, mu n of f and mu of f are apart by epsilon. Right, so we basically just did the union bound over the brackets, and this allowed us to, to argue, to reason that the entire possibly infinite family f satisfies the uniform law of large numbers. Uh, Shai? Yes? Uh, is there a direct relation? I see only in one direction between uh, having a finite uh, epsilon net for the family uh, capital script. I will, and, uh, or you will uh, get to it, yeah. Because we'll get to it in the next slide, <laughs> actually. Okay. Okay, so um, good. So great, so, uh, so as a corollary, actually in, in the next, next slide, Abby, I'm sorry, but uh, so as a corollary, because uh, half spaces have uh, brackets, we immediately deduce that they satisfy a uniform law of large numbers, you know, where B is equals to D log D over epsilon. Okay, so the proof is, is immediate. It's just a corollary of the, this proposition which we just proved and the existence of brackets for half spaces, which we discussed before. Yeah, so we were able to apply an infinite union bound over all half spaces by taking these brackets. Now, let me get to what Avi uh, asked. So here is a well-known fact due to Vapnik and Chervonenkis. So every family of events satisfies a uniform law of large numbers, if and only if it has a finite VC dimension. And moreover, the, the, the sample complexity, this n epsilon delta number is, is tightly uh, characterized by the VC dimension. So, and in fact, you get an even stronger result than what we proved for half traces because the V dimension is D and not D log D. So why do I bother you with all these brackets if it's basically solved, uh, this uh, uniform law of large numbers uh, for family of events? And now also let me, so this moreover refers to Avi's question. So there exists families F whose V dimension is finite but they do not have these uh, brackets of bounded size. And one example of such a family is, uh, arises from the projective plane, from finite geometries. Um, so, yeah, so this is kind of uh, strange, right? So it's, it's a less, the, the bound obtained by brackets is less tight than the VC bound, and also it's less general. So why, why to bother? 
And the reason I bother is because it, this, the proof is much simpler than the, than the VC proof. And, it, and as such, it gives a much more general uniform law of large numbers. So let me, let me elaborate. So observe that once we assume the existence of brackets, all we did was a churn of bound and a union bound. Namely, we just used that every single event satisfies a law of large numbers, and we took a union bound over this fact for all events in the bracket. On the other hand, the VC proof, the stronger proof, uses the symmetrization argument, the double sampling trick, which heavily exploits the IID assumption. Okay? So, the brackets argument applies for any stochastic process which satisfies a law of large numbers with respect to some limit distribution mu. Let's, let's, uh, so imagine a random walk on a graph or a um, Markov chain or dynamical systems like irrational, irrational rotations over the circle. All these stochastic, or actually the last one is even deterministic, uh, processes, they satisfy a uniform law of large numbers with respect to a limit distribution. Namely, if you, if you apply a random walk or apply uh, these stochastic processes, then the number of times you visit the walk visits a given set A converges as the number of steps uh, becomes larger to a measure, to the limit measure of A. Okay, now in these settings, you cannot, you cannot uh, use uh, the VC argument because, because you cannot uh, permute it's not symmetric, right? If you permute a random walk, you don't get a, a, a walk in the same graph. But the bracket arguments, they apply here. We only used union bound and concentration inequalities, churn of bound, or uniform law of large numbers, or law of large numbers more generally. Let us uh, consider one example computing the volume of, of convex sets. So, D.L. Fries and Kanan in 89, they gave an algorithm for computing volume of convex sets in, in, in Euclidean spaces. And the rough idea is to construct a sufficiently fine grid, and then to perform a random walk on this grid, and count the number of times this random walk visits uh, an input set whose measure, whose volume we wish to estimate. Okay, so you want to estimate the volume of some set. You construct this fine grid, you apply random work, and you ask how many times did this work visit the input set. And the analysis is that the, 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 this number of times mixes rapidly to the volume of the set. And, and this is exactly a version of the law of large numbers, right? So the, the the empirical measure, the number of times you visit the set, converges fast to the true measure. And if you think about it now, if we have a family of sets, maybe infinite, and we want to estimate the volumes for each member in the family, we can do it, right? We, so brackets gives us that. It, 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 we get that a single random walk will compute the volumes of all sets in the family simultaneously. But we could not use here the VC argument, which requires symmetrization. So this is just one simple example of, um, even with a computational flavor, of. Um, Hi. Yes. I am not sure I understand this example. What would be the family of um, of convex sets you would apply this to? Various different polytopes. Let's just say half spaces, right? We know that half spaces have brackets. You want to compute the volume of? For example, yeah, so assume you want to compute, I don't know if we really want to do it, but it's just yeah, an example. Uh, I mean, this is uh, it does, it does, something that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, the random walk of uh, Diophrys Kanan uses the, the body uh, 
right? Uh, the work is different for every convex set because right. each time right. it leaves the body, it comes back. So it's not the same random work for different bodies. R Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. You're right. But so, but you can do so. Yeah. I didn't want to get into ex exactly the details, but you can apply if you just do the same random work for all bodies. So we imagine, yes, you, you just do this. You you start in some in a random point, and you apply random work from there. You do a random work in the grid. In the grid, you will still maybe less fast than what they what they do in the. In not be less fast, it will not be good. I mean, you will escape, there will be some uh, convex sets that you will escape and never come back. It is just uh, the whole point is that you want to stay inside the body. Otherwise, you are not going to estimate its volume. No, I, I so if you escape the body, but the, the statement is that if you, if the body has a certain volume, then the, the and I allow the walks to escape the body, but the body, but I count how many times it visits it, then this fraction of times. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, well, we can discuss it later, but I don't see why. I mean, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, so, so I, I don't want to talk, I, I'm also not familiar with the exact details of their algorithm, but the, the basic idea is very simple. So imagine you have a graph, okay? But forget that we can go to the graph later, but in the in the case of uh, uh, space and even hyperplane, uh, you can start a, a random walk uh, and uh, never visit the half space in your life if you are in dimension bigger than uh, three. Right? I mean, there's no somehow. So if you have a grid, we look. We just look at half spaces that are. Uh... All of spaces you have, uh, you have containers and brackets for all. Right, right, right. But but the measure is uh, is whatever the measure the, the limit measure defined by random walks on the grid. Then I don't know if it uniformly holds for all of them. I don't know how. What is the number of steps that you calculate in this case? Um, Okay, I, I, as I said, I mean, okay, it's uh, it's different anyway, it's different than that with Scanlon because they care about, I mean, the, their random work, they depend on the body, and therefore, for different bodies, it does yes. different things. I understand, I understand. So, let me just um, clarify uh, what what the what this statement says. So, imagine that we know that for every fixed set, if we apply random work on the space where this set is defined, then the number of times we visit the set, the fraction of times we visit the set, uh, converges in some uniform rate for every fixed set. That means that uh, but the, this work doesn't, uh, um, you know, change with the set. It's just a work in yes. time. It's yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, so this example is somehow not. Okay, so you just, have a stochastic process that for every set in a family uh, uh, estimates its size after some number of steps, then you can apply. If, if it has containers, then you can apply them. And exactly, exactly, okay. exactly, yeah. exactly, yes. And maybe another, just, just to, to demonstrate the power of, of, this, uh, of this simplicity of the argument, of the bracket argument, so imagine um, an irrational rotation over the circle. So you, 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 you do a deterministic walk on the circle by starting, let's say, at the top point of the circle and then applying irrational, and then you just rotate this point by an irrational number. Then, you know, this, I don't know what it's called, but you know, there's this basic statement that for every measurable set, for every interval, for instance, the number of times you visit the interval, the fraction of times you visit the interval will converge to the to the volume of this interval, right? Length of this interval. And again, you can you can using the fact that the intervals have brackets, you can you can get a uniform convergence simultaneously for all intervals, but you cannot um, apply um, the VC argument here.
you can, but I mean, the original statement is uniform in that case, no? Yeah, so we need it for every fixed uh, event. There will be a bound for how fast this, the, 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 the walk mixes for this event. Well, but this bound depends on the measure of the event in the case. Yes, of the yes, yes, I agree, I agree, yes. I, I don't understand how you get something beyond the original statement in this case. The original statement is already uniform for all sets of some, you know, low bound on the measure, it converges in so many points, so many steps. And uh, this is the... Uh, it's the order of quantifiers. The, the original statement says that for every set of given measure, let's say, if you apply a walk, a single walk, sufficiently uh, many times, then it will uh, approximate the length of the set. But now I apply one single walk for all uh, for all sets. I'm not sure that it doesn't follow from the original statement, but uh, that's okay. Okay, but um, but anyways, the the. the Basically, what I want to say is that since the proof is much simpler, it only uses a union bound, then it applies more generally. Um, and um, yes, and we also know that, uh, yeah, we mentioned it before, uh, that there are classes of finite VC dimensions such as projective geometries who do not admit these properties, and one can also cook uh, stochastic processes. They are more complicated, they are complicated. I will not uh, present them here, but you can cook a stochastic process with the property that every single event um, in, this, in these families, in these projective geometries, their, measure, their uh, measure will be approximated, but you cannot get a simultaneous approximation of all measures. Um, okay. But for deterministic processes, uh, there is no change of quantifiers, right? If it's a deterministic Yes, process, I guess you're right, yes. <laughs> there is no quantifier to switch. Yes, yes, so you need some randomness, that's true. Otherwise, it's probability one. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so let me finish with an open question. Um, so I want to understand really which families have this property, these universal brackets. So let's define, let's define what I mean by that. So we say that the family F has universal brackets with respect to a merger mu, and, and no, universal is for all mu, is if for every epsilon and any distribution mu, we can find epsilon brackets of size which depends only on epsilon and is finite. Okay, so for instance, for half spaces we, in d dimensions, we show that they satisfy this property. Um, so which families have this property? Can we, can we come up with a simple combinatorial uh, um, characterization of such families? Um, and there are some good, there is at least one good reason to conjecture that such a parameter should exist. And the reason is that this property does not depend on epsilon, namely, if universal brackets exist for some fixed epsilon less than one, you can show, one can show that, let's say we have from the F and I'm able to prove that for epsilon equals 0 0.9, then for any measure mu, there exists a family of uh, epsilon brackets, 0 0.9 brackets, of size uh, uh, which depends only on 0 0.9, some finite size, uniformly bounded size. Then you can show that actually F has uh, uh, brackets for every epsilon. So it's kind of a boosting uh, statement. And and this is similar to what happens for epsilon net, for instance. If there's an epsilon net for some epsilon, because it characterizes it captured by the VC, then there is an epsilon net for every epsilon. Because uh, so this is maybe one reason to conjecture that there should be a simple uh, characterization that does not depend on epsilon. And 
let me, so one candidate that arises in this work is the sine rank. So sine rank of a family of sets is finite if and only if you can represent this family using d-dimensional half places. And since d-dimensional half places have, contain, have brackets, then we know that any family that has finite sine rank necessarily uh, also has uh, brackets. Um, so, but we don't know whether it's uh, an if and only if, we just know one direction. Um, yes, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shai. I'm sorry that I was, my Wi-Fi was cut off for parts of the talk, but. Um, ah, sorry. Yeah. Um, but are there any more questions from anyone? Okay, in that case, thanks for, uh, for the talk and concluding a very nice uh, series this semester. We still have another Monday talk next week, so we'll see you then.